There was a, an article in the Boston Globe written by a Jewish columnist on this whole issue of religion in the workplace. And what really bothered this particular uh, woman the most was when her co-workers or her associates in the office would try to push their religion uh, on her. And so in her newspaper article, she says this about one of her co-workers. He's the nicest person in the world, but has the unfortunate habit of using the workplace as a recruiting center. When he approached me to discuss religion, I mentioned that I was Jewish. Big mistake. His face lit up, and I came to find out that converting Jews was his personal mission. I couldn't get up without finding a religious tract in my desk when I came back. After many attempts at conversion, I finally convinced him that I was happy with my religion, and nothing he said would change it. He reluctantly moved on and now tries his hand with our clients. And the title of her article was, Keep the Faith, But Keep It on Your Side of the Cubicle. Well, this raises all kinds of questions for us Christians here at Community Bible Church who are out there in the workplace. Because our whole vision, I mean, our whole purpose for this church is to reach our community with the true gospel of grace so lost people can be transformed into fully devoted followers of Christ. That's what we're about. And as followers of Christ, we are convinced We know that the true gospel of grace has the power to actually change, to actually transform a person's life. Christ has come in and transformed our lives. Somebody along the line came and shared with us about the grace of Christ, and and our lives have never been the same. And now we've got this burden. We have this desire to turn around and share this incredibly good news of the gospel, this free, liberating gift of grace with other people. And most of us, think about it, how your day is divided up. We've been talking about this. You know, about 40% of our time, if you sleep, you know, eight hours a a night, is sleeping. 40% of your sleep, 40 or maybe 50% or more of your time is spent at the workplace. And so, that being the case, the biggest opportunity we have of rubbing shoulders with lost people and sharing Christ with them is at work. At work. Okay, that's our, our field. But then we read in this newspaper article about this Christian in this place of work, and he's a nice guy, and and he's enthusiastic about his faith, and that's wonderful, and he wants very much, very much to share the gospel at his place of work, and so he does, and it backfires. He doesn't turn people on to Jesus. He turns them off. And no doubt when that lady who wrote that article sees that zealous Christian walking her way, she wants to walk the other way. She wants to avoid the guy at all costs. She doesn't want to hear one thing about his Jesus. So how then, how then can we share our faith with people at work in a way that draws them to Christ instead of pushing them away from Christ? And that's what we want to talk about this morning. And we're going to look at a few passages of Scripture together, and we're going to see how to be or not to be a witness at work, okay? There are a lot of things involved with being a witness at work, but but this morning we're going to emphasize two things, two of the most important ways. And the first one might surprise you. It might come as a surprise, but I'm telling you guys, if we don't do this thing first, we're going to have a real hard time even getting our foot in the door with an opportunity to share Christ with our our co-workers. Here it is. If you want to be an effective witness for Christ at your place of work, it is very important that you do your job well. That you do your job well. I mean, whether you're checking out groceries at Rouse's or you're running a small business, whether you're doing physical therapy or being a mechanic or teaching a class of kindergartners or being a police officer, whatever your job is, if you want to be an effective witness for Christ, you need to do your job well. Well, Why is that? Let's look at six reasons why. First of all, you need to do your job well to win the respect of people at work. 
Look at what Paul writes to the Christians uh, in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 11 to 12. Paul says this, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life, listen to this, may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Well, the Christians in Thessalonica, you know, just to give you a little bit of their background, they were kind of in a panic over the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they were so sure that Jesus was coming back any minute that some of them just, hey, they were neglecting their work. Hey, that's not important stuff. And, and they were, some of them even quitting their job so they could just be watching for the Lord's return and being busy, you know, doing his work before he came. And Paul's writing then these Thessalonians to say, hey, guys, yes, it's true. Jesus could come back at any time, but you need to keep your day job, okay? Because it could be tomorrow. It could be 100 years from now. We don't know exactly when. Even Jesus didn't know exactly when, okay? So meanwhile, you need to keep working. Okay, you Thessalonians, you know, you need to work. Work is important. It's an important thing. And if you quit your job or if you start doing a crummy job at work, you're going to lose the respect of outsiders. You're going to lose the respect of people who do not believe in Jesus Christ, the very people that you're trying to win to Jesus Christ. I love the message translation of this in 1 Thess 4, 11 and 12. And it says this, stay calm, mind your own business, do your own job. You've heard all this from us before, but a reminder never hurts. We want you living in a way that will command the respect. Hear that? Command the respect of outsiders, not lying around sponging off your friends, okay? Let me ask you, is your job, and, and the job that you are doing at work it, it is the way that you perform your work. Is that commanding the respect of your coworkers who don't know Christ? Do they respect or disrespect you as a worker? That's important. And unfortunately, I, boy, I, I wish this wasn't true. But unfortunately, some Christians today are, let's face it, are not very well respected at work. One small business owner told his pastor that he doesn't even like to hire Christians. And when he asked him why, he said, well, they've got a terrible work ethic. You know, they're not productive. They expect all kinds of breaks, and they just don't seem to care that much about their work. And this business understand, uh, owner, he just, he just doesn't understand why. But, but that has been his experience time and time again. And other business owners and other managers have told him the same thing. And the weird thing is that that small business owner himself is a Christian. And he's disappointed. And he's embarrassed by the way that he sees some Christians work because those unproductive employ, employees are discrediting the gospel. They, they were undermining his efforts to share Christ with his colleagues. And guys, that's a shame. Wow, that is really a crying shame. If we want to be an effective witness for Christ at work, we need to do our job well. We need to be excellent employees. We need to be excellent employers. We need to let the quality of our work be so good that it wins the respect of people around us at work. And if we do that, if we do our jobs well, that one thing itself will, will more than likely create all kinds of opportunities for us to speak about our faith. And when we do, people will be willing to listen. You know, this applies to you students. I'm glad to see a few students in here this morning in the first service, but it does. And, and I was talking with Robert Durbin uh, this, this past week, talking about the message I was going to preach. And, and he told me that he used to, uh, when he was a youth pastor, tell his kids in his youth group, hey, guys, school is your job. That's your job. And if you want to have a positive impact for Christ at your school, you need to be good students. Not that you have to make straight A's and all that, but you need to be conscientious. You need to show up to class. You need to pay attention in class. You need to do your homework and not be disruptive in class and be respectful to your teacher and respectful to, to your classmates. And if they were good students and not just goof-offs, 
they would win the respect not only of their classmates but also of their teachers, and they'd be much more likely to pay attention to their words when they got around to sharing about their faith in Jesus Christ. Second reason to you do your job well is to attract people to Christ. And we find this in Titus 2, 9 and 10, and the Apostle Paul writes this in his letter to Titus. He says this, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way, listen to this, they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive, attractive. Did you hear that? Have you ever read that verse before? Just kind of, oh, that's slaves that doesn't apply to me. Well, you know, it does apply in our setting as well, even though we, it's not a slave kind of thing. It's a boss-employee thing. Uh, but Paul is telling Christian slaves that if they want to win their masters over to Christ, then the work they do, man, they need to do excellent, excellent work. They need to do whatever, whatever the master asks them to do. They need to really try their best best to try to please that master, no matter what he's like. And they need to not disrespectfully talk back to them. And they need to be thoroughly honest, not to steal stuff from their master, not to cut corners. They need to do whatever it takes to to gain their master's full, total, complete trust. Why? Because that they're loyal, they're conscientious, their their wholehearted work, quote, will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Do you know that in the in the whole letter of Paul's letter to, to Titus, do you know that, that that verse, that passage, is the only place in the letter in which Paul gives a strategy for evangelism? This is it. And what does it have to do with? The quality of work that you do. Haddon Robinson shares about a builder in his community who professes to be a Christian, but he doesn't keep his promises. And his work is below standard, and and this guy can't be trusted. And he has a terrible reputation in town for doing shoddy work, for not being a trustworthy person, and he's just having the effect of undermining the Christian witness in his community as unbelievers look at him and say, well, if that's what Christianity is all about, sorry, I am not interested. So, think about this. The very poor job he's doing in his profession, this Christian builder is hurting the cause of Christ. He's not attracting people to Christ. He's pushing people away from Christ in droves. Guys, we need to do our job well in order to attract people to Jesus Christ. Another reason we need to do our jobs well is because our faith is supposed to influence all of our behavior including our work, okay? Well, part of this series, you're trying to bridge this gap between Sunday and Monday morning, okay? There's, for some people, it's a large, well, Sunday's one thing, but boy, Monday to Friday, that's a whole different ball game. But really, our faith is supposed to influence all of our behavior, behavior on Sunday and behavior on Monday through Saturday. Ephesians 4.1, the Apostle Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord, and he is literally writing this letter uh, to the Ephesians from a prison in Rome, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, boy, he says, I'm urging you guys to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. And here's what he's talking about. If you're a Christian, God himself has called you to himself. And he loves you, and he loves me more than we can possibly imagine. And he sent his son Jesus into this world to rescue you. It's the greatest rescue story in the universe. He came to rescue you from all of your sins, from a life separated from God for all of eternity. He has saved you. He has died for you. He has adopted you into his very own family. And because of that, live a life worthy of that high calling. You live your life with your family. Live your life on the weekends. Live your life at church. Live your life at the camp. Live your life at school. And yes, live your life at work in a way that's worthy, worthy of Jesus Christ and all that he has done for you. Do 
your job well. And then we talked a few weeks ago about doing your job well, a uh, D on your outline, because Jesus is our real boss. Remember that, uh, that uh, verse, with our first message is on this, Colossians 3, 23 to 24, where Paul writes, whatever you do, and that certainly includes your job, right? Whatever you do, whatever job you might have, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. And then he goes on and says, it is the Lord Christ that you are saving. And guys, if Jesus is your real boss, you want to do an exceptionally good job for him. Why do you do your job well? Finally, to not turn people off to Christianity. Writing to his young protege, Timothy, Paul writes this, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of Full respect, underline that, full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered or blasphemed is another translation of slandered. So what Paul is saying to you and what he's saying to me that if you're working for your master or your employer and you're not respecting your boss, you don't really pay much attention to what he's asking you to do. You're always bucking that boss. You're always complaining about the work. You're always being negative. You're always being uncooperative. Paul says that since you are a Christian, since you bear the very name of Christ, since you represent Jesus Christ to the world, then your terrible work ethic actually slanders or blasphemes God and the teaching of God from his word. Guys, this is is pretty serious business. One pastor writes this. I read about a Christian woman named Edna who took a job with an engineering firm. Edna took very seriously her responsibility to share her faith with her co-workers. And when Christmas rolled around, she got permission to hold a Christmas party in one of the company's conference rooms. Her pastor came along with his portable sound system and sang and preached so loudly there was no escaping the sound of his voice. Her co-workers complained about the noise and the distraction. When she was reprimanded for her actions by her boss, instead of respecting his wishes, she took to distributing gospel literature all over the office. That didn't go well either, so she started sending Bible verses by email to her co-workers. Eventually, she was fired for using company time and equipment for non-work purposes. Edna meant well, but ended up alienating the very people she was hoping to reach and losing whatever opportunity she might have had to share her faith if she had simply done her job. Final reason to do your job well is because the excellence of our work gives us credibility to talk up, uh, to our co-workers about Christ and the good news of the gospel. The excellence of work, that gives us credibility. Now, Everybody knows our good friend Al Boykin over there on the, on the fourth row, okay? And if you know Al, you know that Al just absolutely loves to talk about Jesus uh, at work, okay? And, and, and he, Al just has this wonderfully well-used, well-developed, well-fine-tuned gift of evangelism, and he's always looking for an opportunity to share the gospel with people whose air conditioners he is working on. Now, this is not true. I want to preface it, but let me, let, just for sake of argument, what if, what if Al was a terrible air conditioning man? And what if, you know, Al would come in and he'd fix somebody's air conditioner, and five minutes after his truck goes down the road, it breaks down, and Al doesn't come back for three weeks? What if Al overcharged and ripped off his customers and took advantage of people? What would his customers think then about what Al had to say about Jesus. Not much. But that's not the case at all. That is not the case. Al happens to be an excellent air conditioner man. He's done AC work for me a number of times, and he's honest, and he's very knowledgeable, and he's up-to-date, and he's fair, and he's reliable and dependable. He's really, really good at what he does. And so when he shares Christ with his customers, they listen. They listen. And by doing a good job at his work, Al has earned the right to be heard. So if you want to be an effective witness for Christ, the first thing, guys, it might sound kind of mundane, but it's not. It's all through Scripture. You need to do your job well. Number two, 
Second thing we need to do if we want to be an effective witness is to share your faith wisely. Now, we're going to look a little bit at 1 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. So if you've got your Bible, you might turn there. Got your phone, kids, you might go there. Brian, get it on your iPad. Uh, there's a pew rack Bible, whatever. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. It's also up here on the screen. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, Peter writes, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Now, Peter, you know, one of the the 12 disciples, the inner three in Jesus' circle of of disciples, he's writing this particular letter not to any one church, but to just believers who are scattered all over the Roman Empire. And these early believers, man, they were living in places that were often very hostile to, to the Christian faith. And they were suffering social and economic persecution just because they were believers in Christ. And they were finding themselves shut out of certain social uh, places, and, and they were struggling. They were really struggling to find jobs and to do business in their communities. Now, We're not suffering like that to that degree, but it's still true that today's workplace can be an extremely difficult place to live out your Christian life uh, for, for Jesus. So from this passage, then what can we learn then about how to be an effective witness for Christ at work? Well, several things. First of all, uh, here's, here's some things, some principles we can learn. Number one, let Christ be in charge. Let Christ be in charge. Verse 15, in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. This is so important. I mean, this is, I'm glad that's at the first of the statement because, so, but, because the point is, before you try to share your faith with anyone at work, make sure that you're letting Jesus Christ be the Lord of your working life, okay? Just like we've been talking about. Remember, you're working for him and let Christ be in charge, not only of your work, but also your words. When you say your words, how you say your words, in God's timing, not your own. Let Christ be in charge. Then, B, be ready to give good answers to people who ask you about their faith. Be ready to give good answers. Uh, Always be prepared, okay? Be prepared, be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So, if you're living then a distinctively Christian life at work and you're doing your job really well, going above and beyond just what uh, the call of duty is, eventually people are going to come and they're going to they're ask, hey, what, what's the deal? You're a little different here. What, what, what makes you tick? And, and so what this is, you don't have to make a big fuss about it. You don't have to pressure people into those awkward religious conversations. You don't need to hack into everybody's computer at work and put John 3.16 up on their screensaver. Don't need to do any of that, okay? Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Make Jesus the Lord of your work. And people will come and say, man, there's just something different about the way that you deal with these grouchy customers. It's just something different about the way you're handling these pay cuts that are just being given across the board in our community. It's just something different about the way in your approach to raising children or the way that you negotiate deals. And it's just not the way most people operate around here. What makes you different? How is it you can be so calm and so hopefully when the economy is heading south the way that it is? When people ask you those kinds of questions, be ready. Be ready. Don't let it just catch you off guard. Be ready to give them some good answers. Think about it. And maybe say something like, well, you know, the economy is pretty bad right now. But I'm trying to trust God one day at a time. You see, because I've accepted Christ as my Savior, I'm a child of God, and so my heavenly Father, he loves me, and he's ultimately, he's the one that's in control of my life, and I know he's going to provide for me and my family. And how you answer people's questions is important as the content. How you say it 
is important as what you say. And so how do you, how do you answer people's questions? Be gentle and respectful, okay? Very important. In other words, when you're talking about Christ or some Christian issue or whatever cultural issue, you don't need to get all defensive. You, you don't need to get in people's faces, okay? You don't need to argue and raise your voice. You don't need to cut down or belittle what they happen to believe. You don't attack their faith. You're gentle. You are respectful. That is biblical, okay? Another way to be ready to answer people's questions about your faith is to know what unbelievers often want from their Christian co-workers, okay? Kind of put yourself in their shoes. All right, if, if I was a, a, a non-Christian, my, what would I want? Well, what do they want from, from Christians? There's a guy by the name of Randy Kilgore, and he writes an online devotional for Christians in, in the workplace. And in one of his devotionals, he shares how he was uh, uh, talking to some woman on a commuter train, and they started getting into this issue of faith and work and how they mix or don't mix and all that kind of thing. And this woman, she was not a believer, and she had some issues with, with Christians in the workplace. They're talking. And so Randy asked her a question which he asked a lot of people. I mean, this is something he's very interested. And he says, tell me, what are five things... Five things that you want from coworkers who claim to be Christians. And her answer to that question he's found as he's asked this question to, to hundreds of believers, you know, for years and years, the answers are basically the same from person after person from person. Here's her five. She said this, I wish my Christian coworkers knew more about their faith, what they believe, and why. I wish my Christian coach knew more about their faith, what they believe and why. In other words, she didn't want just some little quick Christian cliche answer. That's kind of a pat thing. The person hadn't really even thought about it. She didn't want to hear some embarrassed, some hurried response. No, she really wanted, well, what do you, and why do you believe that? The second one, I wish my Christian coworker had more hope in hard times. Okay, you know, when, when bad things happen in the world, boy, when, when terrorist attacks and planes fly into the World Trade Center, when Katrina comes rolling along, when bad things in life happen, like, like you do lose your job or like life-threatening illnesses or the market plunging and taking your 401k with it or your child getting hooked on drugs, whatever, when those things happen, people, whether we realize it or not, they're often looking to Christians for hope. They're looking to Christians for hope, and they're looking for some source of courage, some sort of strength that's beyond themselves that they, they just don't have. And if our response to these tragedies and these hard times of life, if our response is no different from their response, then we really don't have much to share with them at all. Third one, I wish my Christian coworker could answer some of the hard questions of life. Maybe questions like, well, why is the world in such bad shape? Or how can I begin to change? I've been struggling with this thing forever. Or is there more to life than this? I've climbed this ladder of success. I'm there. And now what? Is there any way to save my marriage? Number four, I wish my Christian coworkers behaved more honorably. Ouch, this one hurts, doesn't it? I mean, it seems that, that people, again, whether they admit it or not, they kind of expect Christians to live more moral lives than non-Christians. And when we don't, they're disappointed. And when the life of someone who claims to be a Christian is not much different at all from theirs, it, it, there's just something real wrong with that. And number five, and I think this is probably the one, one of the most common answers and probably one of the greatest wishes of non-Christians for co-workers of, in Christ is this. I wish my Christian co-workers were more compassionate. You know, it seems that a lot of times, maybe we don't mean to be, but a lot of times Christians just come across to people who don't believe in Christ as harsh, as judgmental, as insensitive. 
As one author puts it, people aren't bothered by the fact that we're passionate about our faith. Yes, be passionate. They just wish we weren't so hard on people who don't share that faith. Just ask yourself. Just, just ask yourself. When someone at work is not a believer, let's say they're all for abortion. They're pro-choice to the max. Somebody at work is, doesn't say one thing wrong with same-sex marriage. It's fine. No big deal. Somebody, somebody at work says, hey, Muslims, they're great. I love their religion. How do you respond to that? Now, of course, as Christian followers of Christ, we have some pretty strong beliefs about those things, and we should. I'm not saying watering down the gospel. I'm saying, but we how, the question is, how do we come across? How do we come across to our unbelieving friends? Do we come across as harsh, judgmental, insensitive, I don't care about you? Or do we come across as loving and as compassionate and as concerned about that person, even though we do not at all agree with their view? Well, Peter has a a lot to say to us about that. He says we're to answer their questions with what? Gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. I'd like to close by telling you a true story about a lady who, who does her job well. And a lady who just, man, this gal, she shares her faith wisely. And therefore, she is an incredibly effective witness for Jesus Christ right there in her place of work. Her name is Linda Wilson Allen. Her job, this mother of six uh, children is a bus driver in San Francisco. Now, for Linda, her job is her ministry, okay? Okay. And she had done, been so effective. I mean, there was, there was a newspaper article that was written about her in the San Francisco Chronicles a couple of years ago. John Ortberg invited her into his church. And he spoke there. Anyway, the, it says in that article this, Linda loves the people on the bus. She knows the regulars. She learns their names. She will wait for them if they're late and then make up time on her route. She would get out of the driver's seat of her bus to help seniors. And Linda, boy, that's just a, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, she just touches the lives of people at her work every single day. L- Linda one time saw that uh, an elderly woman in her 80s by the name of Ivy was, was struggling to get on the bus. She had two big old grocery sacks. And so, you know, Linda, you know, put, put the bus in park, put on the parking brake, got out of her seat, and went down and helped her bring her groceries onto the seat and get her situated. Another name, a woman by the name of Tiny was just really overwhelmed by her kindness because uh, when it was almost Thanksgiving, Linda Wilson Allen saw that this woman, Tanya, was a stranger and she saw that she was lost. And she said to her, you're out here all by yourself. You don't know anybody. Come on over for Thanksgiving and kick it with me and the kids. And she did. Now those two women are best friends. So what's her secret? I mean, come on, her bus route is no different from all the other bus routes in in San Francisco. It's not a glamorous job. She has to deal with cranky passengers and engine breakdowns and traffic jams and gum on the seats and mornings when she just does not feel like getting up at all. So how does she do her job like that day after day after day? Her secret is that she is a Christ follower. And Jesus Christ, she came from a background of drugs and alcohol and all kinds of stuff. And Jesus Christ came in and he just changed her life from the inside out. And she gets up at 2.30 in the morning, gets down on her knees, and prays to her Heavenly Father for 30 minutes. Linda says this about that. My prayer life is my communication with him. He works on my attitude, those things for him to reflect in my life. He could be working on my patience, or it could be someone less fortunate than I am than I am to give them some shoes or whatever the case may be. That's where my kindness comes from. And she goes on to say, God will show you things. He will show you the senior who's having a hard time getting up on that coach and and how to take that bus in there real gentle and set it down right in front of her. 
He'll show you the one who's in the back who might not have all their fare, and he'll say, maybe they just pay what they can. He'll teach you these things. He just shows you. What an effective, what a powerful, what a positive witness for Jesus Christ Linda Wilson Allen is. Guys, let's be like her. And let's be a blessing to the people we work with every single day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we just pray that that you would be changing our lives, Lord, in the way that we, we think about work. Lord, help us to not to see it as a necessary evil, but help us to see it as a, as a, a field on which we can touch the lives of others for you. And Father, help us to do that in a way that, that's honoring to you, in a way that's bold, in a way that's passionate, and yet in a way, Lord, that doesn't just Send people running from the hill, running for the hills. Help us, Father, to love you enough to do it the right way. Lord, uh, some of us are in, in difficult jobs, jobs where it's real hard just to show up. And I just pray for, for men, women in those jobs, Lord, that, that you can help them to approach it with this new attitude. A seeing that they're really working for you. A seeing it as, as a way to to get one step closer to being able to share with a person at work about you. So, Lord, I'm, I, we just pray for this huge chunk of time, this 40, 50 percent, half of our lives, Father. We pray that we cannot waste those hours, but we can use them for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.